Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Amy Research Meeting. Today we have a very special presentation by Ala Youssef and Mylena Ng titled Charting a Path Towards an Equitable Data Ecosystem. And we have Dr. Tina hernandez Bussard moderating today's discussion, and I'll briefly introduce her. So Dr. hernandez Bussard is an Associate Dean of Research and Professor of Medicine of Biomedical Informatics, Biomedical Data Science, Surgery, and Epidemiology and Population Health here at Stanford. Um, with a rich background and vast expertise in biomedical informatics, health services research, and epidemiology, she is at the forefront of advancing healthcare through development, evaluation, and application of innovative methods. Through her research and evaluation of AI technology, she seeks to advance healthcare practices while ensuring these with diverse populations receive equitable resources, and care, and outcomes. So, Tina, thank you so much for being here, and I'll hand it off to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I would like to introduce our speakers today. Um, first, hold on, sorry. Um, so first, I would like to introduce Dr. Ala uh, Youssef. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford Center of um, Amy, um, Artificial Intelligence in Medicine and Imaging, in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. Um, she's received her PhD in population health and medical education from the Institute of Medical Sciences at the University of Toronto in 1921. Um, her research lies at the intersection of AI ethics and safety. Um, her work involves understanding the barriers to AI adoption within clinical workflows with a particular focus on ethical considerations that arise during AI development and deployment. As an educator, um, she is committed to designing AI education and research opportunities that promote a diverse and equitable workforce in machine learning and healthcare, addressing the challenges of bias um, and ensuring inclusivity in the field. So Dr. Uh, Madalena Ni is also a postdoctoral fellow. Um, she is in the Department of Medicine in the Center for Biomedical Informatics Research. Um, her research aims to eliminate the evolving ethical and practical challenges among digital and emerging technologies, such as web and app-based uh, population health research, uh, clinical AI, AI solutions, and blockchain for health data. Um, her work in, the, in her current lab focuses on discerning key factors for clinical AI solutions to flourish in practice, from the readiness of data sets uh, for machine learning research to the operational principles that are required for successful clinical deployment. So um, join me in welcoming our, our speakers today, and um, I will turn it over to you. Um, thank you so much, Tina, for the introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be here and be talking today about our research and uh, journey. So I'm going to share my slides. Hopefully you can see my slides. So we talk. We, so today's project is a collaborative project that spanned two years of hard work between me and Madeline. Ng. So it's a, quite a pleasure for us to be talking and appreciate all of the mentorship and efforts we got throughout this project. So the roadmap for today's talk is to give some context of why this project happened between Stanford Amy and the Moore Foundation, what we were hoping to address, and talk about what barriers we were trying to investigate at the organizational uh, level with respect to data sharing, as well as what are the key characteristics that makes data sets AI ready for machine learning research scientists as well as talk about uh, the new resource that we will be launching soon for uh, data sets. So the, really the motivation for this work um, and really led by uh, Dr. Kurt Lang Lotz um, and, and, and other faculty at the Stanford uh, Amy Center uh, what is the lack that the lack of diversity of public data set is a huge barrier to the development of fair, useful, and equitable AI algorithms. And we know that one of the major concerns for deployment of AI in today's world is uh, fear of worsening health disparities because some of, many of the AI um, algorithms that have been developed have shown to be biased towards underrepresented groups. So the objective was, um, so the objectives is really how can we chart a path towards, um, towards um, equitable data ecosystem 
recognizing that it is important to develop um, to develop pathways that engage, that allow for data sharing, which is the flow for data from the patient from senses apart from the patient to the end users, which is the machine learning scientists and educators. But within this, it's important to look at what are the roles of organizations within academia, um, government, private and nonprofit sectors, and what are the roles of the machine learning users and how they use the data and how can we make the data useful for their research. So the key takeaway from today's talk is hoping that people will appreciate or understand mostly how organizational organization structure can influence data sharing practices. Um, hopefully you can identify barriers to sharing health data in your field and recognize motivation of the organization to share or not share. So the Stanford Amy and Gordon Betty Moore collaboration started in 2021 when Stanford Amy, um, given Dr. Kirkland Glass help, led a grant proposal, was awarded the uh, Gordon Betty Moore Foundation to examine what are the barriers for us to have equitable health data. And so the key mission of that of, of that component is really can we identify the gaps that's preventing the wide availability of AI ready health data set? And can we create frameworks or uh, have ways to assess what are those barriers and how can we uh, overcome those barriers? So the project was composed of three phases. The first phase was looking at understanding what are the organizational factors within institutions that prevent organizations from sharing clinical data. And at the second level, looking at what are the characteristics of health data sets uh, uh, for machine learning that makes them AI ready. And third, can we develop resources that really um, allow machine learning scientists to access high quality data sets for machine learning research? So this is the module I led, which is focusing on organizational factors. Now the Dr. Madeleine will talk about the AI readiness. Um, so for the organizational factors, some of the context of, of this presentation will be focused on understanding the study objective. Um, the approach we have used and some of the key findings and uh, some of the takeaways. But first, I would like to start with a quick question, uh, which is, what are the most common U.S. states from which health data set is sourced to, uh, for deep learning algorithms and clinical applications? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> um, that is correct. So fact is that 70% of the clinical um, the diagnostic imaging um, data sets come actually from these three states. And this was a study published by Dr. Lane Lodz and Kushul Atal and Ross Altman. Um, another component is there is a number of medical imaging studies that have shown that algorithms trained on existing public data sets in medical imaging tend to have biased performance towards uh, underrepresented groups in um, given sex, sex and demographic factors. And even foundation models can be susceptible to bias and reflect the bias that exists within the training data sets. Hence, it's important for us to focus on how can we really uh, have a diverse ecosystem. So this is the kind of the grounding framework of like, who should we be talking to? We knew that the patients give the data, they consent and give us the honor of using the data for research, but we know that the barriers is really at how um, health systems, people who have the data and people who share the data, hold onto the data or share or not share. And so our, our target uh, stakeholders were really understanding people in leadership positions around these organizations to understand what motivates or uh, limits data sharing in those organizations. So the main knowledge gaps in the literature is that we don't know really what makes organizations motivated to share clinical data. We don't know the factors that influence data sharing behavior. And we also don't know how these factors affect cross sector or, you know, like um, cross institution data sharing. So the first research question we asked was what motivates organizations to engage in data sharing? And we looked at a number of uh, 18, institution, uh, 18 institutions. Um, and the second was what are the factors that facilitate some organizations to share data? What are the barriers? And for organizations that are sharing data, how are they doing this? What is the infrastructure and, um, and uh, values that, um, that they share to kind of like disseminate data sharing for the wider ecosystem? 
So the study design in broadly, again, like based on what we defined as the stakeholders, but the data collection, we used um, a component of uh, surveys to capture um, stakeholders, you know, demographic information, but we utilize mainly same structure interviews with organizational leaders because we identified that this will be will provide us with rich information to understand what are the barriers in their context that influence decisions they make related to data sharing. Um, we did a collaborative data analysis, and we also developed a framework that um, that explains why uh, what makes organizations ready. So this is a quick overview um, um, of the study design overall. So we started with the context that we have limited health data set. We understood the knowledge gap. We identified the research questions. We we interviewed. Um, uh, we interviewed um, organizations across the academic government, nonprofit, and private sectors, and we analyzed the data. And throughout the process, we really had a national uh, panel of experts um, um, that really advised throughout the study and gave us feedback um, that helped inform the study as we went a long way. So then the demographic summary of the interviews and how many interviews uh, we conducted. We conducted a total of 27 interviews um, in this in this first study and it spanned across 18 organizations. Um, um, and the proportion of them was mainly in academia, nonprofits, and um, following with government. And then very a limitation was a limited number of interviews in private sectors, um, given you know like. Um, less responsive rate to, to our invitations to accept for an interview. So I'm excited to share that hopefully in the forthcoming publications in German Network Open, um, this will be one of the tables and it shows here that you have the sectors, we shows, um, it shows the organization number of interviews, but most importantly, it talks about the domains in the survey we explored. And so because what a clinical data scientist or a chief data scientist um, roles and responsibilities is can vary across um, institutions. You can see that we have interviewed a diverse number of stakeholders uh, in, in, in academic, government, nonprofit, and private, and um, they had different responsibilities in their institutions towards data sharing. And a key important factor here is 80% of the interviews were conducted in US uh, institutions. We can guess the UK um, institution. So I want to start before delving into the main themes of what are the key takeaways. And the key takeaways um, that I hope that you will take from the study is that um, we, we recognize that organization motivation was really important in driving the behaviors of organizations across the academic government and nonprofit and private sectors. Uh, we recognize that the process of data sharing is really burdensome. And so the process for any of the researchers to put data for institutions to aggregate data is really uh, require a lot of resources and is associated with risks. And that collaborative data sharing um, really comes with um, a village of number of institutions, but it is really one of the broad ways to build diverse data sets. So there are two components to organizational readiness that I would like you to take away. One is organizational motivation, and the second is capabilities. Motivation for data sharing means the willingness of organizations to share data. And we found that across the organizations we interviewed, there would be three typical um, motivations of why they would share, why they would not share. So for example, if you look at academic organizations, they may be motivated to promote scientific discovery and share data to stimulate um, extramural funding, as well as like promote scientific discovery and promote the public good. And some academic organizations might be resistant to, to, to share the data outside of their own institution. Another component is reputation. So many of the many of the organizations would like to be known for publishing big data sets or big important discoveries. And so some organizations might may be resistant to sharing data because they want to be the first to publish about something or a contribution. And most importantly, most of the organizations express a lot of uh, a lot of resistance because of fearing of regulatory risks, and that these regulatory um, risks are associated with reputational harms to organizations. So um, there is a lot of effort that goes into data sharing, but if this if anything that happens, this can damage the organization's reputation. And thirdly, some organizations may be motivated because they drive some sort of financial profit 
um, toward from, from um, sharing that data. And here you see incentives because across of all of these um, types of motivation, depending on the incentives, you can really uh, persuade some of the organizations that are not sharing to be more towards sharing and others that are uh, uh, motivated towards sharing. If there's no incentives, they can really be moving towards um, not sharing. So if you're to look on the second components, which is organizations capabilities, there is a component of facilitators, um, which facilitators are by definition things that will facilitate data sharing. And there are barriers. Um, so on the facilitator side, of course, having access to data sets was really key for organizations to be able to share data. Um, having the technical infrastructure set, such as in the Ivy Tower institutions, including Stanford and others, was really important to allow for, um, for the sharing of data because you have the expertise and resources. And um, most importantly, if you have a streamlined governance process, it can allow um, requests for data sharing to happen quickly. On the other side, the, the counter the counterwise will be would be considered barriers, which is institutions that do not have access to data and need to build collaborations to get access to data had the hardest time in terms of like being able to share and, and access data. Definitely permissions um, and regulatory collaborations, uh, regulatory um, or business agreements between institutions takes a long time and that really impact. Uh, the speed at which organizations um, get access to data and use the data for building algorithms. So if we put all of this together, there is really two components that are taking that, that are happening here. There is organization motivation, which is really driven by the organization mission and data sharing priority, whether data sharing is something that they care about or not. Uh, or is it what 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 Im what impact of data sharing that they are looking for, or the value? Um, and really, um, the, the data sharing organizations that are sh sharing health data are likely to happen if there's an alignment between organizational mission and data sharing priority. For example, if the organization mission is to drive or develop algorithms, um, data sharing might not be a priority, and therefore they might not put all of the resources and investment to share it and make it a public resource. On the counter, if you have alignment, you're likely to uh, promote um, data sharing. On the capability side, we, we, as we saw in the previous slide, the main components of facilitators and barriers, if you have the infrastructure, resources, governance, and expertise from clinical informatics, machine learning scientists, you're likely to be able to share data. So the next set of question or the final question for this component of the study was looking at what motivates cross-sector collaborations. In other, other, in other words, what would motivate industry to collaborate with academia, government to collaborate with academia, and vice versa. So it goes back to the alignment and motivation. And I'll read this quote to highlight that it says government organizations and academia ultimately have the, the good of the public in mind. That is the mission. For academia, the calculation is even more intense because we are meant to be a neutral entity that evaluates science and medicine in a way that isn't biased by profit. Put that aside, the principles of our mission and nonprofit status, uh, I think really do guide us here. That's why we can put governance in place that prioritize ethics over profit. And so that speaks to why different organizations would have different regulation um, uh, rigorness. If we go about incentives and talking about incentives, you can see that um, one of the, the clinical informatics people who spoke in the study was talking about um, one of the ways that they saw building of diverse data set happening was when you can uh, allow people with clinical informatic expertise to help the sites with really low resources to be able to have the infrastructure to aggregate and pull data from their um, health systems. So Stacey here, I do think that there are massive differences between sites, and there are some sites that have ton of informatics expertise, lots of faculties, staff, and computing power, and for the most part, those sites have no problem getting up and running on, at least from a technical perspective. Then there were sites that really wanted to participate in, but they hadn't participated in anything like this before. They didn't, they didn't have a bunch of staff and a bunch of grad students to help out for them. It was a lot harder to get up and running because they were new to this idea of data sharing. So it speaks to the structural inequities that can influence actually those whole systems from participating. And so having incentives to uh, motivate those organizations is really important. So if we take a broader look on some of like the characteristics of organizations, you can see that some are, 
some are really motivated to um, what would be called an organization framework are energizers so they want to really spread the energy of data sharing others are functioning as the role of brokers where they're linking organizations uh, for example health systems with or non-profit organizations that would like to share others um, have more resistance uh, towards data sharing so this table kind of shows that it's important to recognize that there are some variable factors and there are some trending factors. So to provide some context, um, the, the rows represent the different factors and the columns represent the different sectors, academia, government, nonprofit, and private. The green arrows represent an increase or a facilitator and the red arrows increase a barrier. And if you look across, you would find that um, for academic institutions, their biggest facilitator or their biggest advantage in the in the in the in the health data ecosystem is their access to data sets because they're connected to health systems. Government, nonprofit, and private, even though they have the resources, they really cannot start with anything if they don't have access to the data. So this is a key trend because if, you, if academic institutions are reluctant to share or health systems in general, then you really have no flow of data. Infrastructure can really vary depending on the institutions resources as well. Um, AI expertise were, were, were mostly high in all of the, in all of the sectors. Um, I think another important uh, component of the favorable reputation, which is um, most of the academic government and nonprofit are, are more easily likely to be able to build collaborations for data sharing. When it comes to private uh, sectors, there can be some sort of long uh, um, discussions of regulatory components. Um, to ensure that the privacy risks are, are addressed. And then for data sharing, there is um, the organizations in the private sector tend to have a streamlined governance process and tend to be more likely to engage in data sharing and data collaborations. Okay. So I think the five main takeaways from the study is like, if we want to facilitate organizational readiness, we need to work on trust building between organizations. We need to provide incentives for organizations. We need to minimize the barriers that exist for data sharing, and we need to have proper interest management and engagement. And with that, thank you so much for your attention. I'll turn it off to Dr. Matlena. We'll do questions now or later. We'll do questions at the end, so we have enough time for everyone to talk. Okay. I'm not going to unmute, unmute myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, again for the opportunity. Oh. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, again for the opportunity to share. Um, today, uh, I will be presenting module two of this project, or phase two, uh, measuring the AI readiness of research data sets. And thank you to all of for the overview and breakdown of the overall lead project and module one. And while module one is understanding what is necessary in an organizational level to enable the public sharing of health data sets for machine learning, module two focuses on when that happens. Um, When that happens, how do we make sure the data is high quality and useful for machine learning researchers? So essentially AI ready. And we know that the we know that the development of clinical AI solutions require ample biomedical um, and health data. Machine learning research has produced many promising diagnostic AI models across a spectrum of disease areas using health data. 
However, despite uh, initiatives making data available, models learned from this healthcare data are often not useful, reliable, and fair, suggesting they are still there are still shortcomings that really hinder um, their usefulness. And this can be from a variety of reasons, uh, stemming from what is lacking in the data set. So including a lack of diversity in the data, scarcity of high quality labels, and limited clinically uh, relevant annotations. And understanding how to produce high quality data sets that are AI ready and publicly available can really help expedite machine learning discoveries for patient care, allow for a more equitable data ecosystem where all can participate, and promote the responsible secondary use of health data. However, a definition of what really constitutes AI ready data sets uh, for machine, le machine learning researchers was uh, elusive. And this led to our um, this led to so this led to our module where there are three overarching questions to really elucidate this question: uh, What are the optimal characteristics of data sets that are AI ready or high quality and useful for health and biomedical uh, ML research purposes? And from the experience of the specified data set creators and users, so machine learning researchers, we want to identify a set of optimal or fundamental characteristics that these users need. And then two, what are the relevant factors that really drive the creation of these AI-ready data sets? And what do these data set experts really perceive they or the field really need to produce a high quality data set? And then three, what best practices and recommendations really guide the development of AI ready data sets. So we want to aim to provide a set of practices or guiding principles to really help the field in replicating high quality data sets for clinical um, ML. And to answer these questions, we use the following me methodology to carry out the objectives of this module. Um, so through propulsive sampling, uh, where these available sources are used to identify experts who are ideally data set creators or machine learning researchers who are deeply familiar with those data sets. Um, and then those who qualify were recruited through email. Uh, and then we use a qualitative study design where the survey was embedded in the interview to gather basic demographics um, and uh, data role and responsibilities and carry out semi-structured interviews to ascertain their experiential knowledge, as well as what constitutes high quality data or optimal data set characteristics uh, to them in their line of research. And then following in the analysis stage for the survey, uh, summary statistics were generated while three coders carried out thematic analysis on the transcribed interview data. So we were able to recruit a total of 20 data set experts to interview. Uh, here, are aggregate information about their demographics, um, nothing too surprising, and most identify as data set creators and machine learning researchers, and are also involved in tasks across the data set uh, prep data preparation pipeline. So you can see some numbers there. And then here I have a table of the data sets that participants were affiliated with. So there's a wide representation across a variety of data sets, as you can see here, um, just so that we have a diverse people who are really informing the richness of our data uh, in the interviews. So, and then also some of these traits are considered more relevant to data reuse, so that's why we included them. And then some background. So first we carried out a literature review to um, on ver uh, various data quality frameworks and compiled a list of possible data quality elements to consider deductively at the qualitative analysis step and for framework development. So it shows that we're not really working in a vacuum and really respecting the immense data quality work that's already done in the field. So here I, I, I show you some of the existing data quality frameworks out there, including ones that are more general, um, as well as those that are for big data and those that um, take into consideration uh, trust of data provider and ethical usage of data. So we consider these additional dimensions and elements because they're highly relevant topics of concern in machine learning research. And then after the thematic analyses, uh, the synthesis of main themes and sub themes relevant to data set readiness, we iterated together as a team to create this framework. So first we wanted to define what constitutes an AI ready data set 
given existing data quality dimensions. And it's important to note that the data set also lives within the health data ecosystem. So in terms of uh, defining an AI-ready data set, we found that participants perceived data sets are high quality in two ways. Uh, their appraisal can be based on intrinsic data quality elements, which are independent of ML use case. Um, the most important one was reliability, and this is defined as whether the user ultimately trusts the data. And they judge this based on whether the data is accurate, complete, um, gathered using consistent methods, and whether the data is ethically acquired. So some examples of accuracy is like well-defined labels and ground truth annotations. Completeness is whether the data, the size, granularity, breadth, diversity, low missingness, and temporality, temporality of the data is accounted for. Um, and providing a comprehensive pa uh, patient journey also contributes to completeness. And consistency when data are generated using similar methods. And ethical acquisition is where it's a new sort of data uh, quality metric that emerged from our analyses. And that's the need for IRB and informed consent that is appropriately acquired to enable secondary, a uh, broad secondary use later on down the road. And um, I have a quote here uh, that you can see and read. Um, basically, it says that if, if it's not, the data is not ethically acquired, there's a lot of efforts that need to be expended um, at later steps. And then this fits into our framework here as intrinsic elements. And then there are also contextual elements of readiness, which would largely depend on ML use case. So users would appraise a data set quality given this element as well. And largely participants care about fitness of use of the data set, um, which is determined in a variety of ways, uh, mostly context and whether the needs of the machine learning research task matches what is in the data set. And um, so here's quote, there's the intended context. So defining when you are building your model, how do you imagine it would be used? And what is the population you're interested in? How is the population you're interested in different from the population that's represented in the data set? The upstream context is data collection. Downstream context is how will the model be used? And what's the intended target population? So what you really need is to think about the mismatches between these things. Like how is what you have in the data set different from what you want to have. And then another contextual element of readiness that emerged newly in our uh, analyses was ethical implications, um, especially with societal impact, is that participants increasingly feel an obligation to assess the harms, risks, and safety that may arise from using a data set. So for example, um, one participant said, making sure that you're not encouraging bad papers, bad studies to take place. Like if someone submitted some data that was pictures of bodies, uh, pictures of faces and sexuality, and I thought the risk, the machine learning community would pick this up and start trying to develop algorithms that would classify someone's sexuality based on a photo of their face. I don't think that's ethical research. And personally, I'm not going to be involved in sharing data that encourages unethical research. So with that, that completes, um, we've organized elements of readiness that are most important to machine learning researchers. Uh, we also found that participants also talked about drivers that can help enhance um, the creation of AI ready data sets in this health data ecosystem. And number one is a data set availability. Um, the opening up of data sets to scrutiny by the public really expedites the discovery of data set shortcomings so including biases, harms, safety. And this also enables data sets to achieve a sufficient level of readiness when combined with other data sets. Um, but systemic inequities uh, in data availability hinders the creation of AI ready data sets. Um, one participant said, one of the key blockers of doing really state of the art medical research is that there are no public ginormous uh, data sets that people can use or analyze to train really state-of-the-art machine learning stuff. It all has to take place siloed at the institutional level. You really get limited by what's available at your specific university. It creates this almost data equity question where some universities with really talent, talented people just can't play in the same game because the data is locked. There's just no way to get that scale of data. So as Ala mentioned, there's also this data inequity um, uh, inequity 
uh, issue at the organizational level as well. And then number two, um, as a driver, is data quality standards, where the application and use of data set quality standards and frameworks really enhances the prolonged reusability of data sets. And however, current standards really need to be updated with the matters, uh, with, with what matters most to machine learning researchers. Um, so as expressed by one participant, there are all these decisions that really matter for machine learning that aren't really systematically captured. Standards matter, so putting things in standard formats, that's really not been very successful, and that can lead to technical debt. And number three is documentation. So, so accompanying documentation is a component of AI readiness, um, including data origination, data collection, circumstances, uh, data pre-processing decisions, uh, label and annotation generation. Um, and other information that's really necessary for robust and fair model development. So documentation would really clarify a data set's purpose and caveats. So users can inspect, select, and use the most appropriate data set for their research. Um, participants have mentioned that this type of documentation needs to be living and up to date. Um, and importantly, data sets with comprehensive doc documentation really shortens that learning curve for machine learning researchers and really allows for more um, efficient data use. Um, participants said, it's always critical to be open about where the data came from and how it was sourced and what is the data really talking about. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's good or bad, if it's smaller or larger, more representative or not um, of different kinds of populations. I think it's just important to be clear about it because different data sets can be used in different cases. And then another driver, number four, is team science. Um, the people involved in data set creation are very important. Team science can lead to operational decisions that can enhance the intrinsic and contextual elements of data set readiness and enhance perceived trustworthiness of data sets produced. And teams, in team science, you should also consider patients and other data set contributors as well. And um, so one participant said, setting up data for machine learning uh, is so often an exercise in deriving variables, simplifying the raw data and decreasing dimensionality. It is critical that whoever is doing that work has a deep understanding of how the data were Okay. How, sorry about that. Um, how the data were uh, collected to begin with so that when they are simplifying things, they are not totally, totally losing the thread of reality because otherwise you or your model can make some pretty crazy conclusions. And then finally, we have the final driver is, uh, is incentivization. Um, professional and organizational incentives and the reward of data quality work is really needed. Um, people who are who are data quality workers really need to feel valued for the work that they do. Um, but funding and resources for the enormous amount of data quality work to be done remains lacking. Um, plus, those involved in it are stretched thin to the point of sometimes demoralization, um, as expressed by one participant. I feel like in many ways I've kind of destroyed my career by spending too much time on cleaning data and sharing data. Genuinely, I think career-wise, it is not a good thing to do. People don't see data sets as research. So there's a question of, are you actually doing research? There's a lot of work involved in supporting data sets and academia doesn't reward data sharing. Um, furthermore, beyond the individual level, um, incentivization also needs to be aligned on the organizational level to really compel systemic changes that facilitate AI-ready data set creation. Um, one participant said, most of, the, most of the other hospitals would rather sell the data than make it available for research, and a lot of them actually do. So you have the challenge of hospitals being money-making institutions in America, which is an incentive that is deriving a different use of the data, not an altruistic one, but also the problem that it can be difficult to convince someone to take on non-zero risk on distributing patient data so the group benefits. 
Um, and then this leads to the completion of our AI readiness framework. Um, and some takeaways from our work is that no data set is perfect, but there are choices that data set cre creators and the field can make to move towards more AI ready data sets. And focusing on more multifaceted factors such as documentation, team science, data quality standards, uh, data availability, and, and incentivization can really enhance the creation of AI ready data sets. Um, clearer standards at the data set creation stage can also help with AI model reporting at later stages of the AI life cycle. And our study really hopes to bring to the forefront what really matters most to those who are creating and using data sets for machine learning research purposes and provide recommendations to impact current practices. And with that, um, after the work for module one and module two, we next tackled module three, which was to catalog and, and categorize public uh, data sets for AI in a web re repository. So we developed the AME data set index, um, which has an inventory of AI ready data sets for machine learning use. And we've already reached out to the internal AME community for feedback on our beta launch. So I don't know if you've gotten that um, email, um, uh, but we're implementing the changes and before our full launch, uh, so which would be very soon. And I think Ala will also maybe do a demo of the data set index. Um, so please keep an eye out and just let us know if there are any thoughts on, on, on um, how to make the community driven resource more useful. And then finally, I just want to take a moment to thank our incredible team for two years worth of um, awesome teamwork. Um, the core team, our expert advisory panel, and the Gordon and Benny Moore Foundation, and also the Amy community for being so generous and collaborative. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to Ala. So I'll just do a quick share to kind of like show you how you would come on to the okay. So when this is launched, it will be under the Amy uh, data sets. Uh, okay. So here's like the home where you can see some sort of so um on this data set page like this is some of the context objectives and uh, and um context of how, why we developed this resource if you go into data sets this is where you will see the list of data sets there's still not too many but we are hoping that, that this will continue to grow so there's one thing that's um you know like we, we identify important columns for what, how people would search. If you think there are some other important columns that are missing or there's uh, or some columns that are not really helpful, you can feel free to email us at the Amy Center and we can really implement those changes. Um, this is going to be iterative, but if you click on the toggle button, you can see the description uh, or in a list view, all of the data sets. And then if you click on documentation, it should take you um, on to the documentation of each of those data sets. Now, if you are in the column or spreadsheet format, if you click on the data set, it should take you to an internal page on Stanford Amy, which is showing you um, more of internal characteristics of this data set. So if you are inquiring about the data set and not sure if you, you're going to use it or not, it shows you some of the characteristics and then you can determine if, you, if, it's a, if it fits your criteria. Uh, Another component is like you will see that your data source, some of them are based on collaborative uh, components, others are based on single institutions, so you can filter by single versus multiple institution. The other one that might be very useful is by data type. So if you click on, if you type imaging, if, uh, you can filter based on all the data sets that include the imaging. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So we hope How you- How many data sets are in there now? Probably like dozens. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But we're, it's, we're, we're trying to get so we, yeah. information from the community as well, so there's no way we can capture all of it by ourselves. If you see any data sets that are missing, you feel free to let us know. There's also a contribution form on the website that you can fill in and we can um, put the data sets on, on this website. Mm -hmm. And also the Stanford Amy collection, all of it is here. Mm -hmm.
Ja, das ist so.